thank you today for your goodness to us. God, we're so thankful for your grace, for your mercy, O oh Lord. God, we're thankful that we have the opportunity to come into this house to worship you and to give you praise, to glorify your name. God, we ask that you would move in this place. Let your glory fill this place, I pray. And we'll give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen.
you thankful that we can lean on him tonight? He's right there waiting for us. The Bible says, cast all of your cares upon him because he cares for us. What's that saying? It's saying, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Just go and lean on him. There's some days that we just need to lean on him. And I'm thankful today that he holds us, he carries us through the circumstances, tests, and trials of life. Aren't you? I don't know about you, but I can't even walk without him holding my hand. There's some days that the mountains are too high. There's other days that the valleys, they're just too low. But I'm thankful that we can lean on Jesus. Amen. Aren't you? Because he lives and I can feel. thankful for that tonight. It certainly is a privilege to be in the house of the Lord tonight.
I was thinking today, one time, sometime during the day, I'd like to know how many times in my lifetime I've been in church. That'd be an interesting thing to know. I don't know how he knows, but I don't know how I'd ever find out. I love to go to church. I love to be in the house of the Lord. And there's been days that um, it's been glorious. And then there's been days that I'd gone home from church and the Lord had worked me over that day. Anybody else be there? Every preacher should have probably been there once or twice. But I thank the Lord tonight for everything he's ever allowed me to have. I'm grateful this evening for 60, about 67 years ago, something in that area, the Lord filled me with the Holy Ghost. And a little church in Carmel, building's not there now. Brother Coffin probably knows where it's been there a few times. And the Lord got a hold of my heart. I, I fought the Lord. I fought the Lord a while. We had that Sunday afternoon church service, and um, mother and father, we lived in Stillwater at that time, so Mother and father would leave home somewhere around noontime. And I'd get up real early Sunday morning and I'd disappear. And many a Sunday morning while dad was, mother and them was getting ready to go, I'd be out in the woods behind the house there lying under some brush that I had accumulated. And I can still see it in my mind now. Dad would come out and call me. I'd lie there still. And uh, I'd watch him get in the car and go away. And different times, there'd be different things happen. But I'm grateful tonight that one day, one day, I was at the YMCA in Old Town, and I went over there to do a dance, to the dancing. I stood back after a while against the wall, and buddy of mine, in my mind, I said, no, nah, there's nothing to this. I said to my, my buddy, I said, I'm going home. I walked back home about two and a half, three miles. On the way home, I began to talk to the Lord, and the Lord talked to me, and I said, Jesus, if you let me get to church tomorrow, I'll make my dedication to you. And that night I went back home and shocked my parents when I walked in. But the next day I was up, Brother Channel. I went to church that afternoon and God filled me with the Holy Ghost. And I've never turned back since. I say that to say this tonight. Sometimes we might think that, well, you know, some of these young folks may look at some of us old fellas. And, but there was a day we were young. And we had some of the same desires you have. But a decision is made. A decision is made. And I can look back now and I can thank God from the depths of my soul for his goodness to me. Well, I want to turn tonight to a section of the Word of the Lord, 1 Samuel chapter 17, and I'll read a few verses here, and then uh, I hope you pardon me for sitting down, but I, I'm having a difficult time standing for a long time, and what I've got tonight is about a two-hour sermon. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Samuel chapter 17, verse number 38. Saul armed David with his armor, and he put on a 
a helmet of brass upon his head. And also he armed him with a coat of mail. David girded his sword upon his armor and essayed to go, for he had, for he had not, not approved it. And David said unto Saul, I, uh, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. He took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, and in the scrip, his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came out on and drew near unto David and said, the man said, uh, the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine took, looked about and David and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth. Ruddy and of a fair countenance. You got any boys here tonight about 15, 16 years old? All right. That's about what David was. And the Philistines said unto David, I am I a dog that thou canst, that comest to me with staves? The Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air to the beasts of the field and the Lord. And then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear, with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee unto my, into my hand, and I will smite thee, take thine head from thee, and I will give thy, the car carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beast of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he'll give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistines rose, came and drew nigh to meet David that David's hasted and ran toward the army. That's different. To meet the Philistines. Thank you. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine and with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. I want with the help of the Lord, and I'm gonna, I'll try to probably cut some of this out, but I want to talk to us for a while, not on David's five smooth stones. As I was going through this uh, this morning, uh, there's a, a Bible study in each one of these that I'm going to mention tonight. And so that's at an hour of Bible study, that's five hours. And so you can see that it's, it's to dig into every one of these sections that I'm going to mention. Um, it would take a long time, but I, someday I'm going to sit down and do it just to, just to see if I can. You can probably picture in your mind, as I read this, David and Saul and Saul, Saul's army, and how that uh, Saul's army should have been in the forefront, but uh, they were back in the hiding in their tents because they were afraid of one man. And as the Philistines, just as they defied the army of Israel, so there are Goliaths in our world trying to intimidate you and I as apostolic Christians. Just as David wasn't intimidated by the size of this foe, neither should we. We look at the 
when we look at the equipment that Goliath had, and we look at the equipment that David had, and there's, it, there's no question that Goliath could have beat David. And when we today, as individuals just living for God, if we will just recognize, I said, when we recognize that we've got the power of the Holy Ghost within us, and according to the Scriptures, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And we today, as the children of God, have got all we need to defeat the Goliaths in our life. We're the spiritual. We're in a spiritual battle. I think every one of us recognizes this tonight. And if you don't know it yet, you will one of these days recognize that we're in a major spiritual battle in our nation. But Paul wrote in Ephesians six and twelve: For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. I cannot remember ever a time in the history of this nation we've had wick wickedness in high places like we have it today. I can't ever remember reading, I've, and I, men before me cannot remember, never, never envisioned that we'd have what we got going on in our nation today. Now, some of these preachers, they could find five different things uh, to talk about tonight, but I've chosen these five, and I know there's many others if I sit down and, and work on this a little longer to other areas. But I want to talk about these five stones, and the first one is the stone of faith. David had faith. David had faith. And David had faith that God, who delivered him from a lion and a bear, was able to deliver him from the Philistine, from Goliath. He had that faith. I wonder tonight how many of us have had a major battle in life. And that major battle, we went to pray, and we went to seeking God, and God saw us through that major battle. I believe today that every, every battle we win ought to be something happen within us so that the next battle that comes along, we won't have to put so much worry about it because we know that he did it back then, he'll do it now. And so David was not worried about the armor that, the, that Goliath had. He wasn't worried about the sword. He wasn't worried about all of that. Because the day David knew, according to Psalms 118, verses 6 and 8, he said, the Lord is on my side. Do you know the Lord's on your side tonight? I will not fear what man can do to me. If the Lord's on our side tonight, why should we fear what somebody can do to us? I know tonight that uh, well aware of the fact that uh, there's some men here tonight that could easily take some of us down. And uh, I look at these young men and, and, and uh, <clears throat> I love them. They're just, I, I like these guys. They're great kids, well, young men. <laughs> but there's a few of them here tonight that I... I don't want to make them mad at me. Oh, I know that they might respect me, not hit me, but if they do, it's, it's, it's over. <laughs> but the Lord, David said, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. Then in verse 8 says, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. So you see what the, what the psalmist is saying is that there's nothing for us to fear against mankind. Oh, I know they'll, uh, they'll stand up and roar like a lion and, and they might get up there and, and make you feel a little bit nervous. 
But if we've got God on our side, there's absolutely nothing that they can do to us. Oh, yeah, the body might suffer something, but they can't take anything that's going to take our soul away unless we let it happen. We must always remember that the Lord is on our side. Our enemy fought. He fought God all along. You read it in the, just in the third chapter of Genesis, not very many days after the creation of all things. You'll read there where there was a man and a woman and something happened because one, one little snake deceived them. And that's why we have what we have in our world today. So we make choices. And the choices we make needs to be run through the, the ringer of what does Jesus want from me? What does he want me to be like? Faith is that vehicle in which we receive all things from God. Hebrews 11 and 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We hope for things, and we got faith that it's going to happen. We don't hope for something we can see. I don't hope tonight that you come to church. I can see you're here. I don't hope for something that I know is available for me. But I do know tonight that that relationship with God can take away some of that, that, that hope that we might think is got to be there because we just don't have quite enough faith or confidence to get a hold of what the Lord wants us to have. So faith is an important, extremely important uh, ingredient in our heart. And it's the thing that David had when he walked out onto that field. I noticed, and I think you heard me say it, that when David, Goliath came out there, David didn't cower back like his brothers did. He ran towards the enemy. What do you think the devil would do sometimes if we... We think he's beating on us if we just turn around and start running right at him with our fists doubled up. I know that might sound you know, nonsensical possibly, but still the fact remains that we must have confidence in the Lord God that lives within us. He lives within us. You know, some people, they, they struggle, struggle to get the Holy Ghost. I don't know why they do, but they struggle to get the Holy Ghost. When receiving the infilling of the Spirit of the Lord, that we always talk about as being the infilling of the Holy Ghost, it should be the easiest thing in the world for an individual to get. It really should be. Because the Bible says that if we repent and get baptized, we're going to receive it. There should not be a big struggle. I might have mentioned here at some time in the past, but I'll just briefly say we had a young lady in Attleboro. She lived in Boston. She was going to a large denominal church in Boston. She got hungry for God, and I haven't to this day, I don't know how she got my phone number. But she got our phone number. She called the, the, uh, the house, and I wasn't there. My wife was there. She answered the phone. And uh, this young lady said, I, I, I want to get the Holy Ghost. Where's this affecting? So she said, uh, my husband will be back in a while. And I got back and I called. And the short end of this story is she came from Boston to Attleboro, about 45 miles, hungry for God. She came into the house. We went into the fellowship hall of the parsonage, and we sat and talked for less than five minutes. Stood up, joined hands, and just prayed a little while, and God filled her with the Holy Ghost. Why? Because she was hungry. She was hungry. I think there needs to be something happened to us today that that faith that we know God wants us to get something, that we'll have such a hunger for it that when we come to the house of God, regardless of what it is, we'll walk into the house of God expecting God to meet that need in our heart and our life. So, Lord, increase our faith tonight. Give me an increase in my faith tonight that I might get receive what you want me to have. The second stone is a stone of love. This stone is always the right side. 
It's a one size fit all. It's always the right size. There's a whole lot in the Word of God about love. And that's why these three, five subjects, that's why you can find out why I know that it's a lot of teaching. But when you read the Word of God and you read all of the, the scriptures concerning the love of God just in the New Testament, you've got a lot of verses of scripture to read. And so we need to say, all right, God, I want to know the love of God in my life. We need, we need to recognize the fact that when we come to him, he's already put the love there. Every one of us have got love within us tonight. Every one of us have. And so what we need to know is, all right, God, I want you to come into my heart and my life to the point where that love that you placed within me is going to do a tremendous job in me. And so we find today that Jesus Christ is full of love for us. Mark chapter 12 says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. With all thy heart. With all thy soul. And with all thy mind and with all their strength. When I read that over again this morning, I said, God, I've fallen far short of that. Because sometimes I don't love the Lord that way. Probably more than sometimes. And I got a feeling tonight that I'm not the only one. I'm supposed to love him with everything within me. Oh, I know sometimes we say we do, but uh, what happens when we leave church and what happens when we're out in the workforce or going to school or wherever we are makes me to wonder sometimes how much does Carol Kennedy really love God? Oh, I can say I love him with all of my heart. I can say I love him with all of my soul. I can say I can love him with all of my mind and with all of my strength. But do I? Do you? You see, what we need to know tonight is that the Lord is there for us. He's not there. He's not there to beat us down. He's there to make us to understand how much he wants to give to us. And went on to say this is the first, this is the first commandment. And the second is like unto this, namely. Thou shalt love thy neighbor. Now, Lord, why didn't, you, why didn't you stop before that? It's easy to talk, you know, to one another about loving him with everything within us and all that stuff. But now, Lord, this, this loving thy my neighbor as myself. Now, that's a different story, Lord, because you don't know my neighbors. Oh, yeah, he does. Oh, I, you know, probably some of you tonight can say, yeah, you got to come live by some of my neighbors. Yeah? I'm talking about the, that, that power of God that lives within us known as love. And so in order for me to love, the, love my neighbor as thyself, I need to love the Lord according to the first verse I read. If I love God the way that he wants me to love him, then it's not going to be hard for me to love my neighbors because he's going he's to intensify that love within me. And he said, there's no other commandment greater than these. And when I read that this morning, Brother Chandler, I thought, my Lord, no greater commandment than these. And you read through the Word of God and you can find a whole lot of commandments that we put a lot of emphasis upon. But the greatest of them is to love Him the way I mentioned and then to love you, my neighbors. Love that neighbor down the street. Love that one across the street that just drives you up a wall. Love that neighbor, you older folks, when that neighbor cranks their radio up 
or cranks uh, whatever they use for amplifying stuff. You, you just love them no matter how much you like to go and put that thing in the dumpster, whatever it might be. I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is that there's something about us. See, the Bible teaches must, me, I need to love my brothers and I need to love my sisters that I can see, that I come to church with, that I associate with when I'm not in church. I can love them. I might not love like something they do. I might not like something they say. You might not like something I do or say. You might not. That's, that's pretty normal for all of us. But the Bible didn't say I have, to love, I have to love them like I like them. I can love them and not like some of the things that they do. I can love them and not like some of their attitudes. And so the Lord is letting me know that I need to love my brothers and my sisters. I need to love them. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. I was listening to somebody a while ago on my computer that went down through this 13th chapter, 1 Corinthians, and I thought, oh, my goodness. He brought some things out there that I had never heard before, never thought about before. That is one of the... the if you have a difficult time with love, read the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians over and over and over again until it gets into your heart and into your mind. John said in chapter 15, verses 9 through 13, I'm not going to read them, but he lets us to know that we need to love one another as he loves us. Now that's hard sometimes. That's difficult sometimes. But we need to somehow come and get in such a love with Jesus Christ that the love one to another, the love across the aisles, the love back and forth, the love we work with, the people we work with, there'll be a, a genuine love there so that everybody you work with will, will be really enjoy working around where you are. So we love one another like we should. We will defend one another when someone says unkind things about them. I think that's known as gossip once in a while. I've been in situations in my ministry, my lifetime, I've been in places where there were some people couldn't wait to get out of the building to tell something they heard or they surmised. So the Lord tells, tells me that I need, I, I need to love Brother Channel. I need to love Brother Mayu. I need to love these young men, these young ladies. As he loves me, I need to love them. It's easy to spread gossip. That's easy. Until gossip comes back to me. Until I'm the one that is the center of the gossip. When we should in our walk with God, I'm talking about love, when we should in our love for God and our love for one another, when somebody says something you know it's right, you know it's not right, why are we so bashful? Why are we so timid to speak up? I, I don't want you to ask me, but why? I, I, there may be some of you here today that you, you know some people that they, they just... They just, the, the, the devil himself is living in them. And they come and spread all kinds of stuff, and you wonder, why? And then there's some good child of God, and, and somebody begins to gossip about them, and we sit back and say nothing. And when we sit back and say no, nothing, we are in reality and say, I agree with what they're saying. So we find today that this church that the Lord has made, that we are part of, it's a great and glorious church, but it's going to be greater and gl more glorious as we live in harmony one with another. Again, I come back. There's some things that we may do that you don't like. If you're human, there's some things that, that happens in life that you don't like. But we can never stop loving one another as we come in this great arrangement known as the church. Third stone is the stone of humility. 
28th verse, part of it of this chapter I read says, Why camest thou down hither? In other words, the older brother. What the older brother said, he didn't know what dad had done. And David never, I don't find anywhere where David said, now daddy sent me here. I haven't read that yet. So his oldest brother said, why came, why did you come down here anyway? Oh, I know. Who, who, who sent you? They, they, they want you to know so that, no, he said, who did you leave those little sheep with back home? Those few sheep. Well, I never found out how many sheep David had at that time, but it was a few hundred, I'm sure. But the oldest brother minimized David coming down there. Who? Oh, I know. I know. You've got pride in your heart and for your naughtiness. David could have said to his brother, Dad told me to come down here and bring you this food. I'm here because Dad told me to come. See, you see, sometimes we have a misconception of some things. And so David could have done a lot of things. He could have said a lot of things at this point. But I don't read where he said anything against his brother. I don't read where he said anything against what his brother said. And so we find that David wasn't out there to make a name for himself like his brother thought he was. If we're out trying to make a name for ourselves, and I, um, we might find out that not too many people interested in what kind of a name we might try to make for ourselves. So we find today that in the first chapter of John, uh, verse 4, it says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So when somebody comes against you and they try to pick something pick you apart in some way, or do some things that, that would be uh, like David was accused of, we can sit back and say, well, I, you know, I'm here because the Lord wants me here. I'm saying what I'm saying because the Lord wants me to say it in the right manner. So the, 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 the humility, see, humbleness, humility, is in Bible school and uh, teaching, one of the teachers was teaching us and she was teaching us on humility. And that's, a, that's quite a subject and when you're in Bible school, they drill that into you pretty hard. Um, so after the teacher had taught for quite a long while, one of the girls, uh, I shouldn't have said the girls, one of the students raised their hand and she, the teacher recognized her, and she said, that's my strong point. You might know if I said her name. I'm not going <laughs> to. She was a wonderful person. Really was. And, uh, but you see what happens is sometimes humility is a hard thing for us to accept when somebody says some things to us, letting them know how they feel about us. And I say it in sincerity, and that because they realize that you have a, a humble spirit. And a humble spirit is a wonderful thing for an individual to have. Number four is a stone of confidence. I, I've been thinking about how can I say this initially. How can a person have confidence in themselves and what they're doing and some people misunderstand it? You see, there's a way to have confidence without having an individual read something into it that's not there. David, I'll come back to him for a few minutes. Can you imagine what David was facing now when he got out there on the field? Now, it's one thing to say something when you're back here. It's one thing to say something when your enemy's a long ways out there. But when you've got an enemy coming at you, and you're just a 15, 16, 17-year-old young man, and so David 
could look at this. Now he looked at this man and he said, okay. He said, I got I to gotta do something here. Here's a guy that's nine feet tall, thereabouts. He's got armor on him that weighs over 200 pounds. He's got a 25-pound spearhead. He's got an armor bearer going before him with a big shield. And here's a teenage boy. Forgive me, fellas, for saying it that way, but that's what it is. And so now what's David going to do? He's got confidence that he can do what he said he was going to do. Not in himself. You see, that's what we have to come to a knowledge and an acceptance of. I, I don't have confidence that I can do these things on my own. David could have said to this, this giant, I I'm going to beat this tire out of you. I'm going to take your head off. And he could have bragged about it. But then he could have turned around and run too. But he didn't do that. You see, in that few moments of time, something happened. I think this might have happened. I, now, I know that it wasn't written at this time, but I got a feeling this thought at least could have crossed David's mind. The Lord is on my side. You need to know that. The Lord's on your side. And David could have said, the Lord's on my side. I am not going to fear you. What can man do to me? Goliath, what can you do to me? I'm on God's side. God's on my side. And God is all powerful. So he said, uh, what are you going to do Get it's better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in man. So when you're in a battle and things look bad, maybe it's easier to give up. But you can't give up because the Lord's on your side. There's not a battle that you'll ever be in, will ever come your way. But what God has already been there. There's not anything you're ever going to face, but God's already faced it. There's nothing that can come your way or my way that can defeat us if we got the attitude and the spirit of God within us and the confidence of God in our heart and our life that God's on my side. It doesn't matter if the giant comes against me nine feet tall. It doesn't matter today if he comes against me with a sword and a spear or a shotgun or a whatever. That doesn't matter. God's on my side. And they're not going to defeat me. It's not going to. I put my trust in the Lord because he's on my side. We, I can't remember the last time we sang, but we used to sing a, a chorus quite a bit. Put your trust in Jesus. He'll see you through. For us, for you. He bled and died for. It's for you he gave his life for. So we can put our trust in him. I can't put my trust in this world. I, I was reading some things, my computer, and uh, I, I, I don't have any, every little thing I had in retirement, it's gone. I made sure of it. In fact, I was at the bank one time, oh, a year or so ago, I said to the young man that was waiting on me, I said, uh, if I came into the bank said I want tomorrow and said, I want to I wanna draw $20,000 out of my savings account, could I get it? He said, no. I said, why? He said, we don't carry $20,000 in this bank on any given day that we can't use. And if you come in and want $20,000, we've got to bring it in from another bank so I get it the next day for you. Well, I thought, okay, I don't... But as I read things today and as I listen to some of the news things on my computer, I'm glad I'm not depending in mankind. I'm glad today 
that there was a way that we could uh, do things that caused us to be able to not worry anymore about what's going to happen to my minister's retirement fund. Oh, I, I had it. And I recommend it to any, any young preacher that's in our fellowship today. I recommend them getting involved in, in some kind of a retirement plan as early as they can. You say, well, the well, Lord's going to come. Yeah, I preached that 65 years ago. And he hasn't come yet because I'm still here. I don't think he's going to live six, I don't think he's going to stay 65 more years before he comes back again. But what if he does? When I was on the general board, uh, I was in the, in the meetings when the minister's retirement fund was being discussed. And I remember sitting beside another, a couple of other young men of my age, in my age bracket, we was all in our late 30s. And uh, we were sitting at, and just talking back and forth while the discussion was going on the around us. Here we are sitting talking about retirement funds and the world's going to hell in a handbasket. But 60 years later, I'm still here. Oh, I know everybody that was back in that day, they're not here now. So I'm not, I'm not saying we don't get involved in things that's going to prepare for the future. Please don't misunderstand me. I, I, I'm 100% behind anybody preparing for the future. But don't let that keep you from being what God wants you to be. Don't let that stymie what you can do for the kingdom of God. And so we need to make sure that we've got confidence in God. And regardless of what happens in this world, we got his. And let's face it. All of these multi-billionaires, guess what? When they die, somebody else is going to get it. I remember many years ago, one of my friends pastored a tremendous church in another district. And um, he said, I he, he just was sitting around talking. He said, I, I got the feeling I'm going to have my church about a two or three million dollars in debt when the Lord comes and let the bank take it. Well, that's not the best way to look, don't look at it probably. But so I'm not I'm not advocating those things. I hope you understand that. But we cannot allow this world to dictate our relationship with God. All right, stone number six, five, and I'm going to try my best to get done. Stone number five, the stone of service. David called himself the servant of Saul on many occasions, even though Saul was wanting to kill him. Romans chapter 6, verses 16 and 18 says, Know you not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are, to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. See, we should, we should have that, that servant attitude in our relationship with God and with one another. Servant attitude. It's not, you got to wait on me all the time, no. See, we have become servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must be the best we have the ability to be. We must, we must be able to do those things, those talents we got. Work on those talents. Present your talents to the Lord, you young folks. I, I'm, I, I get excited. I really get excited when I look up here on a Sunday morning and I see four or five, I think they're all, all teenagers. Maybe one of them isn't, but I think they're all teenagers. Then I look over here, and, uh, and I see young people over here. That thrills me. That thrills me. 
because I can remember once or twice before we came here on a regular basis of coming and seeing some of the young people now that does a really good job, they were just starting out. I played the trombone when I was younger. My mother and father probably wished a thousand times that dad hadn't have bought that for me. But you see, what I'm saying today is that hey, there's practice. You know, doctors practice medicine, right? Dentists practice dentistry. Lawyers practice law. Preachers practice preaching. <laughs> Am I right, Brother Channel? Yeah. And so whatever your God has laid upon your heart, whatever kind of talent you may have, as long as it is okay by the leadership, <laughs> make it so that Everybody wants to hear you. I, I haven't played a trombone now for probably 35 years. So you don't want me to go and get one. You really don't. Because I couldn't play it like I did back then. And there's some things that we, we, we lose if we, don't, if we don't keep on. I know it for a fact today that if, if you're called to do something, if you just, you young people and you, you older young people that are, are talented and you're using your talents regardless of what they are, you sit on it for a while and you wonder, well, where in the world did it go to? That's been one of the most difficult things for me in the last eight or nine months because I haven't been able to do some of the things I want to do. I still can't do a lot of the things I want to do around the house and things that I want to do activity-wise. But I'll tell you what, if you don't use what God's given you, you're going to lose it. And so use it today. Be faithful. Be, be just so you want, God, I got a talent. You've given me a talent. And God, I want to be faithful. That's the greatest thing you can do is be faithful. Be faithful. The pastor and Brother John, the assistant, they're going to look at you. They're going to watch you, and they're going to see your faithfulness. And your faithfulness is going to elevate you to a place where your talents are going to be able to be exercised. And so we find today that uh, the Lord wants us to be faithful. He asks us to be faithful. And we need to kill the giant in our life. That giant unfaithfulness. I'm going to say something, and I hope it's okay to say it. Once I say it, I can't take it back. One of the things that has bothered me as a pastor for over 50, about 50 years was some people that was not consistently faithful to the house of God. Now, I'm stepping out in a place that I don't have a right to probably, Brother Chandler, I, but faithfulness to the house of God is, is so important. I pastor small churches. Amen. I've been involved. And in a small church, we may think we come here Sunday, we'll have 70 to 90 people in the congregation. You might look around and say, oh, wow. Oh, wow. But there's over 100,000 people with an easy driving distance from where we're sitting this moment. And this building wouldn't hold them. So faithfulness, 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 not only to the house of God, that is extremely important, but faithfulness in what your hands find to do. I remember as a young person growing up, as a young preacher, I had some of those older preachers. Uh, I, I think sometimes we're pretty, we're pretty kind to you. I think it was some of those old preachers got after us, some of us young guys when I was in my 30s, 20s and 30s. And they let us know that uh, we weren't there yet. 
we weren't there yet. But I can look back at some of those things now and I, I'm where I am today. Whatever I, whatever I am and wherever I am is because there were some men back in those days that wasn't afraid to look me in the face and say, you can't do that. It can't be done that way. You gotta, you gotta tone it down a little bit. You gotta watch what you say. You gotta watch how you say it. Sometimes it's not what you say; it's how you say it. And so the Lord wants us to be faithful, to be faithful. I'm not gonna read it, but there's a chapter in the First Corinthians, chapter 12, beginning at verse number 12 to the end of the chapter. I recommend you read it. I recommend you read it. Because Paul in that chapter talks about the body of Christ. And every one of us today in the body of Christ, we make up the body. And is waking up the body of Christ, making up the body of this church. It's going to be what we make it. There was a saying going around back many years ago. If this church was just like, if everybody in this church was just like me, what kind of a church would this church be? They drilled that into us in Bible school, and that's a, different, that's a different place to go because it knocks off some edges from you. You learn how to live with one another. You learn how to interact with one another. And sometimes it's, uh, they got some edges knocked off you didn't think you had. And so what the, Paul is talking us here in this chapter is we need to say, all right, God, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what you want me to do. I'm part of the body. And so David only had one stone, but that one stone killed Goliath. And I said in the very beginning, one stone can defeat the enemy. And one stone, there's a lot of this tonight. I, I did it in less than 50 minutes, and that's longer than I should have been. But I'll tell you what tonight. If we open our hearts to God the way God wants us to open them to him, there's going to be some things happen in our individual life that's going to make us over new. Oh, I think I'm okay. My wife and daughter can tell you long how, how not okay I am. But I think I am. <laughs> and all you married men, your wife can tell you how on. Yeah, they can tell you how unokay you might be at times. But I want to be okay with him. I want to be okay with him. Brother Coffin and Brother Johnny and Brother Chris a week ago, all three of them, those men walked over me. Oh, I, 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 I can't think that I was out there sinning. But there was things I was struggling with in my spirit and in myself. And all three of these men spoke into my life last week. And it's that kind of a thing that we need to have. We need to make sure the ministry that's going to minister to us from the youngest to the oldest. We're going to listen to them. Because they, if they're in touch with him, the Lord, then the Lord knows what you need. He knows what I need. He knew what I needed. And he used the youngest among us. And he used another one that's not quite so young. And he used another one that's a little older than he is, I think. What did he do that for? Because he knows that I needed it. He knows that I needed it. And he knows that you need what you need. And so don't, don't, don't push it aside. Amen. I'm gonna, I don't know who I'm supposed to turn this to. But uh, I, I, I hope I said some one thing tonight that helps somebody. I tried to watch the crowd, and I know I went longer than I should have. Please forgive me. Because uh, you've all been out, many of you have been out there working all day. And I've been home drinking coffee and laying around all day. <laughs> no, I haven't. 
Amen. Speaks to me with my 